Hi, I'm Bruce. Uh, are there any questions? I'm serious, actually. Are there any questions? This could be a really short talk. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> Not what I expected. Yes. Uh, the question was about authentication in wireless networks with a lot of transient devices. But let's sort of generalize that and, and let's talk about authentication in sort of any system where, where, thing, where things are changing. And it could be a wireless network, it could be a, a wired network, or I mean, it doesn't, you know, what the medium is doesn't matter. Uh, we got a lot of issues here. You know, there's, there's a bunch of, uh, of people that believe that we're going to solve internet security if we can just get attestation right. right? If we can just know who people are, just authenticate people. I know people in this room, I'm sure, understand why that's nonsense. But it is a pretty pervasive, uh, pervasive thing. In general, right, the more you can control the device, the better authentication you can do. So your cell phone will have better authentication than your computer just because the company that builds your cell phone, the network, I mean, they, they own the firmware. I mean, they own a lot more of the network or your, or your, uh, your iPhone or, you know, any of the devices where there's a lot of control. And you can also think of, uh, oh, I don't know, what else, your Slingbox or you know, anything attached to your television, the gaming console, right, where the hardware and software is on the manufacturer's control, it's pretty hard to, to add anything. So it's going to be a lot harder to, uh, to fake authentication. You know, in general, Authentication is good. It tends to work in areas where the users want to authenticate. Right? I actually like it when my cell phone authenticates the network because that's how I get phone calls. So I'm likely to be on the same side as the system that makes it work. I mean, sure, there'll be people hacking it, but by and large, people are going to want to make that work. Right? I want to authenticate to my email server. You know, I might not want to authenticate to uh, some file sharing system. I might want to do that anonymously. So it's going to be a lot harder to build a system to make it work. Right? In, in general, and I did, a, God, I did a paper on this with Adam Shostak a good 10 years ago, that when you start uh, breaking up systems, when you have, let's say, a smart card and a reader and you give the card to the user, when you take the security system and hand pieces out to different parties, you tend to have a lot more problems because you can't necessarily trust the different parties. It's a lot easier for me to build a security system based on, oh, I don't know, a bank account number where you, you do produce the number or a bank card that has a number. That number is just a, a pointer to my database. I mean, I don't care if you hack it. I mean, you know, I mean it's, it's my database. You show me the number and I, and I figure out how to make it work. If I give you a smart card with a chip where that chip is doing its own authentication, suddenly I'm handing you the device you could hack. And it's a lot harder to build those security systems. So I don't know if I answered the question. Those are some of the sorts of things that come to mind. Right, someone asked me about AES. Okay, so people heard the news. Uh, I, I talked about this yesterday at Black Hat. Yesterday, and I blogged about it yesterday, there was a new attack against AES. Actually, a very, a very major attack against AES. No reason to panic, you can stay. Because if you panic, maybe you'll never get out of here for two hours. But th this is actually a big piece of news. So let me, let me sort of give you two uh, preludes and I'll talk about what happened uh, yesterday. So AES is uh, the new, uh, since about 2000 I think, uh, encryption standard by NIST. There was a whole competition. Uh, I participated. I had two fish. And uh, an algorithm called Ringdahl won. It uh, came out of... Uh, of Belgium, and this became AES. AES is defined uh, with three different key sizes, 128 bits, 192 bits, and 256 bits. The algorithm is the same for all key sizes except the number of rounds is different, 10, 12, and 14, and the key schedule is different because the keys are larger. So that's what we have, and you know, pretty much everything out there nowadays has migrated from DES to AES. And so the question that you want to look at when you see an AES device is AES what? AES 128, 192, or 256. That just tells you the key length. Okay, so that's, that's sort of AES background. Let me talk a little bit about something called a related key attack. 
wow, cryptographers need to write papers. <laughs> and one of the things we do is we sort of invent threat models that we use to evaluate the security. One of the threat models, this was really, it was invented in the late 90s, and I'm sorry to say I think I was the one who did it, uh, is a way to look at algorithms, a way to attack algorithms based on related keys. So and re related keys are, are different keys that are related by some mathematical property. So like a key and the key inverse, for example, would be a pair of related keys. So, and, and there are, there's cryptanalysis against algorithms based on related keys. So you might be able to break an algorithm, and I'm just making this up, with 2 to the 80th work and 2 to the 20th related keys. Right, so that means you, you, you need 2 to the 20th different keys where you don't know what they are, but you know their mathematical relationships. And you know the plain text, you know the ciphertext, sort of a standard, uh, standard model for, for breaking crypto systems where you know everything except the key. But in a related key attack, you know the key relationship. Uh, they don't have a lot of application in the real world. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to imagine a system where you can say to an oracle, this is just the way we think of it, encrypt this, thank you. Okay, now encrypt this with the key inverse, thank you. Now, right. But it's certainly possible. Uh, there are some applications when you use a, uh, a cipher as a hash function where you see some related key properties that they, they matter. But largely it's a theoretical attack. Okay? So what we had yesterday as a group of cryptographers, and I'm, bl I'm blanking on their names, at, it's, it's on my blog, that uh, have a new attack against AES, it breaks only AES-256, it's kind of interesting, and it only it breaks 11 rounds of the 14. So this is an attack against 11 round AES-256. Uh, against 10 rounds it's like 2 to the 40th and like, uh, something like 200 related keys. Against 11 rounds it's 2 to the 70th, so it's sort of just barely not feasible with a similar amount of related keys. Uh, this is a big deal. It's a big deal cryptographically because it's a huge improvement over anything we've seen before. Uh, this is actually the third in a series of papers that have come out in the last few months that are improving these related key attacks against AES-256. All right, so what does this mean for us? Well, first of all, it does mean, luckily for us, not to panic. Uh, not to panic for several reasons, right? One, uh, we're not breaking the full anything. We're still in reduced round. Two, we're not breaking AES-128, which I believed was the most common variant, and I've been told otherwise, that, that more and more people are actually using the larger key variants. And three, it's a related key attack. And related key attacks tend not to be applicable in the real world. But still, this is very startling. I mean, what it means is the security margin we thought we had with AES, we actually don't. Like there's an old adage in cryptography that attacks always get better, they never get worse. You know, I mean, it's trite, but it's also kind of profound. Right? Everything done always builds on something else. Right? The attack that, was, uh, well, that I wrote about yesterday built on a paper I co-wrote in 2000 where I broke seven rounds of AES-256 using related keys. And then it's been extended to, to 8, 9, 10, and now 11. Right, and, and attacks always get better, they never get worse. There's no reason to believe that this is the last word on the topic. You know, if you can go from 7 to 11, you probably can go from 11 to 14. How many years will it take? We don't know. Has anyone done it yet? Nobody's admitted to it. So what doesn't mean that people are reading AES traffic. I mean, the, these attacks are theoretical. You know, even though they have practical complexity. But still, uh, it's time for NIST to start thinking about how to modify the AES standard to get a little more security cushion. It's funny, reading back at stuff I wrote in 2000 about, about Ringdahl, I suggested doubling key lengths, and that, you know, that's actually not a bad idea. So we'll see what happens. But, but this is actually really interesting news. So I, I wanted to tell you that. There's a hand right there. No, it's you. <laughs> uh, 
So the question's about sort of security in general the users. Uh, there's a paper I just saw that came out of Carnegie Mellon, uh, which proves something we already know, that uh, users ignore security warnings. <laughs> it's a surprise. But actually, you know, this is interesting. People have a really good sort of risk barometer. They have a, they have a good sense of, of what's risky. And the reason people, are, let's, let's take sort of the one we all get, the uh, SSL certificate out of date or invalid. Right? We all ignore that all the time. The reason we do is because we know it doesn't matter. Right? The problem with security warnings is that they don't actually warn anything. They're generally CYA devices. Right? You know, it's not my fault. I gave them a warning. I mean, geez, don't. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the innocent programmer. He, he, he was the one who clicked OK. That's not my fault. And we have a problem with that. You know, in a sense, if the programmer can't figure out what to do, why does he think the user will be able to figure out what to do? Right? The user's not smarter than the programmer. So one of the problems we have with, as you said, putting users on the front line of security is they're not equipped to be there. They don't have the expertise to understand that security warning you're putting up there. You're giving the user information he cannot process. Now, sometimes we're stuck here, right? We don't know enough to design the security properly to make the decisions for the user, so we're kind of stuck sloughing the decision off on him. But it's not a good solution because the user can't make good security decision, largely because the warnings happen too frequently. So it's a cry wolf syndrome. I mean, if I, if I yelled at you duck, you duck, right? Because that's a warning you take seriously. But if I started doing it all the time, you'd kind of start ignoring me because then nothing would happen. And we have that problem, you know, sort of so many areas of computer security that the bad stuff looks like the good stuff. And the program can't tell the difference or chooses not to make a, a decision and hand the decision to the user who looks at it and says, you know, I clicked OK 80 billion times previously and nothing happened, so I'm going to click OK. Or I don't understand this. I mean, I mean there's a website you want to go, God, someone, uh, I gotta forget who did it, put up a, uh, has a, has a parody of, of a dialogue boxes. You know, the, the great, there's a great website you want to go to, but there might be problems. Go there anyway, annoying bullshit. I mean, what are you going to click on? Right, you're going to click on go there anyway. And that's the way users see those warnings. So what can we do? I mean, our job, I think, is to, is to figure out how to give users real warnings. Right? SSL certificate expired or invalid is not a real warning. Right? You're going to a known phishing site is. And it's not just a warning, it's I'm not letting you go there. Go, go find some, go, go to a Microsoft browser if you want to go to that site. Right? I'm, I'm not going to let you. Right? And something like that. Or is, you know, I really, really, really think you shouldn't do this because it's really bad. You know, so, uh, an actual warning. And have it be correct. Right? Those sorts of warnings people will listen to because they'll be real warnings. So us as security people, this is, I think this is our problem. Right? We can't assume the users can answer questions that we can't. We have to figure out how to answer the questions. Oh, I saw your hand first. What worries you most about cloud security? About what? What worries me most about cloud computing? Cloud computing, I think, is, is in some ways worrisome, in some ways not. I mean, cloud computing is just a new name for an old thing. Right? It reminds me of time sharing in the 60s. Right? <laughs> you know, in, in, the, uh, well, in, the, in the 70s, in the 80s, you know, I was using uh, a punch, uh, punch tape, and the computer was, was across the city. I mean, you know, all these remote systems or a client server from the 80s and 90s, and now it's called cloud computing. I mean, fundamentally, what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're doing the computing somewhere over there. And what, 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 what should worry anybody in any of these sorts of systems is trust. Right? Fundamentally, you have to trust who's ever doing the computing for you in whatever paradigm you have. 
Right? Cloud computing is, is Gmail. Cloud computing is Facebook. Cloud computing is sort of any of those systems where your stuff is on someone else's machine. Uh, computing is all about trust, right? And whenever you boot your computer, you have to trust the operating systems, the application software, the network you're on. I mean, there's a whole lot of trust built into computing. We don't really think of it that way, but there is. And this is just another layer. So in, in some ways, it's no worse. You know, you already trust, you know, maybe Microsoft with your, uh, your word processing files. Now you go on Google Docs. Now you trust Google with your word processing files. It's kind of the same thing. Like both of them can have security flaws. Both of them can make mistakes. Both of them can screw up and, and compromise your data. It's, you know, the effects could be worse when you move more control, the more control you give up. This is the future of computing. I mean, don't, don't think for a minute this isn't what everyone's going to be doing in a few years. I mean, you know, I feel like I'm the only person who, uh, you know, actually deals with my own mail, my own computer. Everybody I know, you know, out in the, not us, out in the real world, right, is moving to, to Gmail and all of those uh, internet-based email systems. I mean, I think that's nutty to give up that control, but it's normal. Right, people are moving to Google, Google Calendar, Google Docs, all those things. Right, Salesforce.com is taking over. Uh, you know, th systems for doing, uh, which I thought would never work when it was showed up, uh, external filtering of email looking for, uh, for malware. Right, but not, now that's normal. So this sort of thing is normal. And, it, and it's, it's going to be the future. The problem here is trust. You have to trust whoever the entity is. And that's hard. On the other hand, the companies that do this have to be trustworthy. So they're going to go out of their way to secure their systems more than most users will, right? Because their reputation is greater than any individual user. So I think there's promise there. So that's what I think about cloud computing. Uh, I mean, the worry is going to happen so fast that it won't be able to be uh, secured properly. But it is happening and, and, and you can't stop it. You know, it will be the holdouts. Oh, let's go to a different part of the room. Oh, way back there. Yes, you. No, don't turn around. Stand up. You know, it's, it's hard to tell. There's a, there's a lot going on right now in the administration on cybersecurity. There's a huge uh, power struggle on who gets to control what. I mean, and often when I see stories in the media about these huge cyber risks, I always wonder which agency is leaking it for what reason. Uh, and we don't, we don't know how it's shaking out. Right? You know, Obama's going to appoint a, uh, a cybersecurity head, which I think is a great idea. I like it if he has budgetary authority. But we don't know who, know who it is yet. And we don't know what's going to be done. We know that uh, the military is doing uh, their own cybersecurity. That makes a lot of sense, right, both offensive and defensive for military purposes. That's perfectly reasonable. Uh, who controls the, uh, the civilian government network? We don't know. You know th there's reasons why you want to centralize some things and decentralize other things. So it really remains to be seen. I don't know, if, I don't know what's true yet. And, and I think we'll know a lot more with who, uh, who's appointed. I actually would rather uh, President Obama appoint someone more political to the head role, have a technical person under him. I think one of the problems we've had for past cybersecurity czars is they've been too technical and not political enough. Because in the end, this is about politics, it's not about tech. And you, and you know, if you have a politician who listens to tech, you get a lot more done than you have a sort of a tech person that tries to listen to politics. Because politics just makes no sense. So we'll see, uh, we don't know. All right, someone asked me about SHA, th about, uh, SHA 3. That's another interesting topic we have. Yeah, okay, yes, hey, yes. Excellent. <laughs> so after, uh, after NIST had such success with AES, a couple of years ago, they decided to uh, have another competition to replace uh, the Shaw family of, uh, of hash functions. 
And uh, right now, I don't know if people sort of know we had SHA-0 and then SHA-1 with a, with a minor modification. Now there's, a, there's the, uh, the SHA family, there's a SHA-2. And NIST wants to sort of scrap those and, and get something new for the, for the next, uh, next uh, decade. A really good idea. I mean, these competitions are actually huge impetuses for research. I mean, lots and lots of, of teams all over the world uh, submit algorithms and they break each other's. The, the, we have a little problem though. I mean, it, NIST, which was with the National Bureau of Standards in, back then in 1976, and did a call for algorithms for a block cipher. They got one submission for DES. Uh, 1986 was nothing. 1996, they had a call for submissions for AES. They got 16. Uh, 2000, I guess, 7, they did a call for submissions for a new hash function. They got 64. So you notice the little geometric progression we have here? Which means in like 2017, if they call for something, they'll get 256 submissions. These are a lot of submissions. 64 is a huge number. So NIST got 64 uh, submissions for a new hash standard. They're calling it SHA-3. I think that's dumb. I think it should call it the advanced hash standard. I mean, duh. But they're calling it SHA-3. And uh, so 64 submitted, I think 51 met the submission criteria, and they came from all over the world. Uh, we had a, an initial conference on, on the SHA-3 competition in, I think it was February, in, in Belgium, attached to the Fast Software Encryption Conference. And just, I think last week, the week before, uh, NIST announced uh, the 14 algorithms, I think it's 14, that are going on to, that, that have been selected to go on to like, the next round. I mean, you might think of this as the great crypto demolition derby. <laughs> right? We'll put all the algorithms in the ring, beat each other on the head, and the left, and the left, and the left standing wins. It's not really that way, but it sort of is. And anyway, so there are 14 algorithms left. Uh, my submission, along with, uh, I think it's eight other people, or seven other people, I forget if we're, I forget if we're eight or nine total, is, is Skane. And we're one of the 14 going on. Uh, it, it, it's a good set of algorithms going on. What's, what's interesting is uh, the, these new results against uh, against uh, uh, Ringdahl, against AES. A uh, surprising number of submissions to the SHA-3 uh, use AES. One of the reasons is uh, the, uh, the Intel chip, the next generation, is going to have an AES instruction. It's going to have an AES round instruction. So you can do this a lot faster. So any number of hash algorithms took advantage of that and produced uh, algorithms that use AES or, or parts of AES. So it's sort of unclear how this, these results will affect them. So right now there are 14 algorithms left. Uh, I think NIST is going to pick one by 2011, I think is the plan. And I think there'll be another narrowing from 14 to let's say 5 and then from 5 to 1. So, I mean, this is great for crypto cryptographers because you know, what cryptographers need are targets. Right? Remember, cryptographers like to write papers. The best way to write a paper is by breaking something. Nobody wants to see your new design unless you have a trail of, of heads behind you. Right? So the way to get cred is to break stuff. Right? And there's now lots of targets out there. Uh, of varying degrees of, of, of quality. I mean, they're, they were easy to break targets. They were lots of hard to break targets. So that's what's going on in, in SHA world. Again, uh, there's no cause for panic, right? SHA-2 is, is fine. Both of these algorithms, SHA-2 and AES actually, are, are optimized for 32-bit words. So they're not as efficient on, on the modern CPUs. Uh, when NIST asked for SHA-3 candidates, they, they asked them to be optimized for 64-bit words which I think is a good idea. So that's what's going on in the SHA world. Yes? What's going on with TSA these days? What's going on with TSA these days? Your guess is as good as mine, right? I mean, Kip Hawley resigned because it was a political appointment. So he resigned when uh, the presidential transition happened. And uh, Obama hasn't appointed anybody to replace him. So near as I can tell, TSA is kind of in stasis. There's no... I'm sure there's an acting head. I don't even know who it is, right? It's someone who stays out of the news. Uh, I haven't seen anything different out of TSA in months, except I think now you have to take your shoes off and not put them in the plastic bins. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's what, that, that's, what, that's what passes for policy change at TSA these days. 
Uh, but I haven't seen any news. E even their blog has gotten boring. You know, when, when Kip Hawley was around, there were some interesting things in there. So I think they're just sort of treading water, waiting for some, uh, some political direction. You know, as much as I hate to admit it, uh, it, I don't think that Obama can make any serious changes. I think politically he's not going to risk it because th there's no upside. It's all downside. And this is a problem we have sort of as in society when security ratchets up. That it's very hard politically to say, don't do that anymore. Because if something happens, you are dead. I mean, you're, you've been blamed. So I think, uh, you know, the TSA security measures are going to be with us for the foreseeable future. Right? Just like, you know, we got the, uh, the photo ID check requirements after, God, I forget which plane. It was a plane that went down that it was thought it was a missile or thought it was, thought it was some kind of bombing, but it turned out to be an accident. Right? So, so the, the security measure wasn't needed, but it never went away. So I, I don't think things are changing anytime soon. You know, it's, you know we're not, I'm just not seeing a lot of movement out of there. I, I, know, it's this, I know this stuff brewing in, in sort of other areas of, uh, of national security, not, not TSA. But I, I, it, making changes is hard. I mean, doing the right thing is very hard in this case because doing the wrong thing is more politically expedient. And it sort of doesn't matter what party you're from. That's true. So I'm not optimistic about, about near-term changes. I'm going to take the hand way back there. Yes. No, you. I don't know the PKI vulnerabilities that are announced at Black Hat, so I can't comment on them. Is that, uh, is that the uh, sort of universal cert, or is that something else? Yeah, so none of this surprised me. I mean, there's been a series of stuff. I, mean, I actually, I mean, I don't know that I don't know what was announced, so I really can't comment on it. But, but in general, I mean, you, you get these kinds of things, right? And any security system is going to have problems. So, I mean, you know, PKI isn't so sort of magically uh, invulnerable to that sort of stuff. So, but, but I'm sorry, I, do, I didn't. Uh, I've been I've been busy enough the past few days. Oh, right there. Yeah, I, I mean, this goes back to the first question, the, the, the notion that if we could just figure out who everybody is, we can magically make the Internet secure. I mean, it's just not going to work. So I actually think it's a negative. I think the more we rely on identity-based security, the more fragile our systems become because it works well until it fails. And this is why I'm sort of against national ID card. I think we are served far better in a security uh, way by having multiple IDs in our wallet with different rules for issuance, authentication, revocation, expiry, issued by different organizations, by you know the the this by the state, your passport, by I don't know your bank, by your library. I mean, you, we, we all have many different cards in our wallets, and, and the notion that if you just sort of have one card, you're more secure, I think is wrong because forging a credential. Is a, ba you know, is a balance between how expensive it is to forge and how valuable it is once you forge it. So sort of paradoxically, by making a single credential harder to forge, you make it more likely to, for to be forged because that delta changes. So maybe instead of costing $100 to get a fake credential, it costs 1000 But if instead of being worth $1,000, it's worth $10,000 or more when it's forged, it's now more likely to be forged. So I really like systems that minimize identity-based security. I, mean, I like systems that are secure regardless of the identity of, who's, you know, of who, who you're looking at. I mean, the airline security measures that work have nothing to do with identity. The photo ID check, I think, adds no security. An example. Right? So reducing anonymity doesn't help. God, I don't know. I don't know the Diane Reem show. That's just a radio host. I was on the show maybe about a, six months after or eight months after September 11th, or maybe it was more. Because I was actually I was debating a DHS person. It must have been over a year later, and 
the DHS, we're talking about ID cards, and identity, identity checks. And what he says is, when you're in an airplane, you want to know the identity of the person sitting next to you. And I said, well, no, you don't. I want to know if he's going to blow up the airplane. <laughs> and if he's not going to blow up the airplane, I don't care who he is. And honestly, if he is going to blow up the airplane, I don't care who he is either. <laughs> right? Who he is is completely irrelevant. So I worry about a fetish for reducing anonymity because I think it makes for more fragile security. I mean, once you build a system that relies on, on, on identity as its linchpin for security, you just invite identity theft and, and, and various hacking by which you masquerade as somebody else. And, when, and you, so you make that the way people are going to break into things, and that's bad. So you're stuck building a backup system that provides security anyway. So I'd rather, when possible, right, ditch the whole identity piece and, and, and work on, you know, I don't care where the, I don't care who sent the packet and why, I wanna know what it's gonna do, right? Because if I don't like the packet, I'm gonna dump it. And knowing who it is doesn't really help. Because even if it's a known person, it could still be a, a, a nasty packet because uh, his system's been hacked. So I do worry. There, there is this fetish in, in, in the world today that identity is, is going to be how we're going to solve our security problems. Right? We just knew who everybody was. We knew who all you were. We'd know who the terrorists are. We'd just arrest you all. And that'd be easy. Then we'd suddenly be safe. Right? I mean, this is the way people think. Right. It assumes that we have this you know, master list of terrorists, which of course we don't, and we can identify people properly, which of course we can't. And so it just doesn't work. I mean, lots of places identity makes sense. Right? I have an employee badge. Right? I have an account on my, my, uh, my corporate network. Those make a lot of sense. A lot of places identity makes no sense. I mean, I love identity-based security at my bank. I mean, that's good, right? Because I get my money and no one else does, right? I like that. But in a lot of places, it doesn't make sense, and you're better off dumping it. Uh, but I think there's something we're going to have to fight. We're, we're going to be losing the battle for anonymity on the net. There, there's a lot of pressure to reduce anonymity. And of course, there's a lot of social value for anonymity. But I think this is going to be a hard battle, and we're going to lose in the near term. And that's unfortunate. Oh, let's go to this side. How about way back there? I am doing fine. All right, what's next? <laughs> All right, you get two questions. Okay, so uh, as you talk to Obama, and if so, why don't you tell him and where do you buy your uh, braids? Where do I buy my what? Your braids, your hat. My hat. <laughs> Actually, it's a neat place. It's the JJ Hat Center in New York. They've been in business about 100 years. So it, it is a cool store, so I'll, I'll say that. No, I have not talked to Obama. Kind of neat, I, I, but I, I, did an, I did an essay God, about like a month ago, uh, which, which started with the rubric of, you know, if I had, you know, a, an, a, an elevator pitch to Obama, and this is what I'd say about how to fix cybersecurity, this is what I'd say. For the life of me, I can't remember what I wrote. <laughs> I mean, this is actually embarrassing. So I invite you all to read that and pretend I said it while I was standing here. You've heard my voice, so you can probably do the cadence. But you know, you, and I wrote it recently, it wasn't even a long time ago. I am the shadow of the man I used to be. Yes. The question of comment on privacy in what, what, what context? On the ownership of your data. This is actually a real important trend. And it's about privacy and the ownership of your data. Uh, we're now living in a world where we tend not to own our data. And I'll get calls from the press all the time about things people say. But I ask, what can people do to pr protect their data on Facebook, on, on Gmail, on this service, on that service? And, and the answer is nothing. You're screwed. Right? <laughs> Fundamentally, most of our data isn't owned by us anymore. Right? It's, and this gets into the cloud computing. It's going to get worse. That my critical data is owned by somebody else. I mean, identity theft. 
I used to say, you know, shred your trash. Nobody steals identity out of the trash anymore. It's too annoying. You steal, you know, by, steal by hundreds of thousands out of some database somewhere. And you, the user, the owner of that identity, has no control of that database. So there's not a lot we can do. Right? This has implications in, in it for our legal uh, structure. A lot of our, our laws against illegal search and seizure involve our person, our cars, our homes, the stuff around us. But different laws apply for third data that's being held by third parties. So what you know, Facebook might have to go through to release your data is different from what you might have to go to to be forced to release your data. So the rules are changing. You, you, you asked about, about privacy. The thing I actually also want to mention is pri the notion of privacy is, is changing a lot. I mean, essentially, the internet is the greatest generation gap since rock and roll. And you must believe it is that. I mean, and there's a huge difference between how, I'll use the terms, the elders use and perceive the internet and, ha and the young people, the internet generation does. Right? You can see the gap by asking someone, do you use Twitter? And you'll either get, why in the world would you ever do that? Or, of course, who doesn't? Right? And those are the two basic answers. And, and that's the generation gap. So, there's, there's some research we're starting to see. Uh, uh, Dana Boyd has written some great uh, papers uh, on young people and how they use the internet. In terms of security, there, there's a lot more focus on control. That, that the young people seem not to be less concerned about security, but security is generally about control. They're certainly more open, right? Everybody under, under 18 has been dumped on, uh, on Facebook, right? They know what it's like. And those things would never happen in, you know, in a public forum to people who are older. Uh, people who are younger tend to put more stuff out there that their notions of privacy are a little bit different. And, and, and things are changing. Uh, the notion that the young people are more security savvy is, seems to be complete nonsense. Uh, in general, the young people are extremely socially savvy about the, about the internet, but not technically savvy. So I, I'm reading uh, sort of interviews with people who are using the net, you know, sort of random, random teenagers. And they don't know the difference between data that's on their computer and on the internet. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, this data is out there. I mean, a lot of people are, are sort of platform independent, that they, they can use whatever device is handed to them. And they like that. It means everything they do is in the cloud somewhere. Uh, it's a really surprising thing I learned, that it's not uncommon in high school. Uh, that you give your password to your boyfriend or girlfriend. That it, is a, that it is a show of trust that you give them your password. Which means the, uh, you, when you sort of br the break up with someone, change your password, must be done in the correct order. <laughs> but so that's an interesting social mechanism that never occurred to me. But that, but that is not uncommon. And, and sort of, I'll hear a lot of people, especially the older people, talking about how the young people don't understand privacy and, and are sort of doing it wrong and they get into trouble. When, 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 you, when you think about generation gaps, right, so then think about the glass, think about rock and roll, what the elders would say about rock and roll, right? The death of marriage and women running amok and you sort of, I mean, drugs and sex and I mean, they pretty much nailed it, right? But we're all okay. So as a general rule, when you see a generation gap, what all the, the, the horrors the elders talk about will come to pass, but the younger generation is right that it won't be the death of civilization, that it'll be okay. And we're seeing that. When you see a generation gap is a people fired for blogging. So the, or, or people, when they apply for college, the admissions officers go look at, you know, last night's party.com or Facebook, right, and, and uh, deny people either a job or a college admission because of stuff on there. That's a generation gap, right? You know, when we, when we, when we live in a world where the world leaders send lolcats to each other, right, that's when we know we've passed it, right? When the U.S. president actually twitters and the, Twitter, and the tweets make sense. I mean, you've got politicians twittering 
but they, you, 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 you see they're doing it wrong. Right? That's going to change. Right? In any generation gap, the younger generation wins because the older generation dies. All right, so I think I have time for one or two last questions. So short questions would be preferable. Uh, you in the way back, why don't you walk up and you'll ask the last question. I'll take a, another question from someone who's closer here. That you two fight it out. It's Friday, any squid news? So I get asked all the time about squid blogging. And if people follow my blog, every Friday I post a squid post. And I'll get emails saying, what is it about squid blogging? And I write back, I do them on Friday. <laughs> I get people who say, hey, do less squid blogging and more security. Like there's some conservation law that every squid post I make means one less security post. I assure you that's not the case. And in fact, posting about squid is the easiest part of my, my blogging day. That squid news turns, I mean, I had no idea there was this much squid news out there. But yeah, I, mean, I do get odd reactions on, on, on doing squid blogging. So and I, who's the last question? I did ask them to come forward. Did they not? Oh, you did. Okay, yes. So from an engineering perspective, where is the key? Like, I can get a bunch of explosives in a car or a plane or whatever, and fly through a building, whatever. But how come we haven't seen a lot of... It's an excellent question, right? I'm going to repeat the question. From an engineering perspective, terrorism is easy, yet it doesn't happen a lot. What the hell's going on? <laughs> Perfectly reasonable question. I assure you, it, it, you, know, you look through the past eight years, I mean, administration officials will say that again and again and again. I wrote about bioterrorism a couple of weeks ago, and there was a quote from the United States, uh, I forget which cabinet officer, said, you know, it's so easy to poison the food supply, I'm amazed nobody did it. Well, a couple of things. One, it's actually not that easy. Right? It's easy from an engineering perspective, but unlike an engineering project, if you make a mistake, you get arrested. Right? This is actually sort of in general why there aren't many criminal masterminds. It's hard to practice. <laughs> right? If you're a good guy, you can practice, and if you make a mistake, you get better. If you're a bad guy, you practice and make a mistake, you go to jail for 10 years. So it's, it's hard. It is harder. So, but yes, anybody can, I mean, you, you can come up with a bunch of steps to do a terrorist attack, and it's pretty easy. But actually, each step has some percentage of failure, and you know, add the percentages up, and it's, pre, it's pretty rare. I mean, in some ways, 9-11, terrorists got really, really lucky. They almost failed a bunch of times. And it's unfortunate we're sort of basing our national policy, international policy, based on really, really lucky, but we are. So one, so terrorist attacks are actually not as easy a, a, as they seem. Two, the hard part seems to be not the technical, but the, but the personal stuff, the people stuff. Right? Getting the people, getting them in the position, getting them not to talk, getting them not to screw up, that's a lot harder. Getting people willing to do it. I mean, you, know, you think terrorists are dime a dozen, but they're actually not. They're, they're pretty rare, right? despite their... Uh, this sort of marketing campaign. Sort of interesting that, that I mean, different, terrorist, wait, different terrorist groups do have images, right? I mean, Al-Qaeda seems like a really lousy terrorist group with a great image. You know, the IRA was a pretty good terrorist group with a terrible image. You know, and, and different groups sort of have different, sort of different ratios with that. But that's a good question. And, and, and those who are doing terrorism policy, I wish would think about that more. If it's so easy like we think, why has it not happened? So with that, I'm going to end. I'm going to room 106. Uh, I'll get in. <laughs> I can't promise any of you guys. Well, I, I can promise some of you. I can't promise any of you in particular. So I'll go there. I'm happy to talk more, answer questions, sign books, chat. I'm not doing anything today. So uh, welcome to DEF CON. Have a great time, and thanks for having me.